She's pursuing her PhD in the political science department at UH Manoa, where she is studying the formation and history of Kanaka Mali stevedores. Prior to this, she received her degrees in Hawaiian studies from UH Manoa and HCC in Hilo. Her activism is hashtag no kalahui, and her priority focus for the past 10 years has been organizing for the protection of Mauna Kea and in resistance to the US federal recognition of Hawaiians. Her professional life recently transitioned from working at Native Hawaiian Student Services at UH Manoa to her current position, which is now as an organizer for the Hawaii State Teachers Association. Education is a site of political contestation as her presentation will highlight. I also just wanna add that Alima and her work has been a tremendous influence for us as curators creating this exhibit. Uh, we as curators read her master's thesis together. Um, it's, it's so heavy and so powerful and so beautifully written. Uh, and it's available online and you should read it. Uh, and I'm just so thrilled to be able to welcome her here tonight and to have her speak for us. And so with that, I am going to pass the imaginary microphone over to her. So thank you so much. Please welcome Ilima Long. Thank you, Jillian. Thank you, Kelly. Aloha mai kako. Um, it's great to be here for this reason. And I, I just want to start out by saying aloha. There's I have quite a few beloved friends on this um, on this call here. And as I'm looking at their names, each and every one of them are educators. Um, but I want to thank you, Jillian, and um, and Kilu Fox and everybody who was uh, who has put time into this exhibit. It is a very courageous, important, necessary, um, provocative exhibit. And I had, um, I had the pleasure of, of visiting it, I think last week with my friend who's on this call here, Joy Enamoto. And it really kind of provided even more layers for the, this is my master's research that I um, that I'm presenting tonight, and I'm gonna I'm gonna try and put these in conversation, um, the exhibit. So I did take the liberty um, to include a couple of photographs from the exhibit. Um, some of them were taken by Joy, some of them by myself, to just sort of <laughs> not that not that the exhibit or my thesis stand alone need any added heaviness to it, but you put them together, and it just it kind of um, make some things hit home in a, in a different way. So um, so tonight I'm just gonna give a quick outline of my, my presentation. I'm gonna give a little bit of background on what eugenics is. I'm gonna talk about how it was introduced into Hawaii. Um, and I'm going to provide a little bit of context about territorial Hawaii so that we can understand and think about what was happening around eugenics within this context. Um, and then we're going to take a little bit of a deep dive into a curriculum called Eugenics for Young People, which was created for the boys and girls of Kamehameha schools. Um, and then we'll we'll just sort of process it that we'll process that together, I guess, in some some Q and A. And you know, again, this is my master's thesis, and um, this is not necessarily my my focus focus topic right now. And so I really want to encourage everybody who's on here, especially those who are doing research students, anybody else to really pick up. These are all tips of the iceberg. So to pick up any tip you like, and you know, expose the greater iceberg. Um, so with that said, I'll go ahead and share my screen and start my presentation. Okay. So I call this work unfit for a queen because um, there is a, there's a national element to this. Uh, when we think about the history of Hawaii and where Kanaka Mali were coming into the territorial period from. Um, so the way that I have thought about eugenics in Hawaii in relationship to Kanaka is sort of as a tool of empire. Um, and, and some of this language will make sense as we go throughout the presentation. Okay, let's see. Okay, so I think 
most people probably have a basic idea of what eugenics is, but um, the concept of eugenics, it's sort of this weird offshoot of uh, Darwinian evolutionary theory um, that gets into the social element and was sort of developed in the middle of the 19th century and then kind of really put into practice in the early part of the 20th century. And it's the idea that um, all, of, all of these social elements that we take into consideration um, and that impact society are, are biological. And so what that translated into for eugenics was, um, it, it sort of was talked about in two forms, positive eugenics, which was this, you know, sort of intentional uh, pairing of, of folks with high qualifications or characteristics um, and, and to build out those genes and, and those people. And then negative eugenics, which was about eliminating those who had less uh, desirable characteristics according to a certain segment of the population. Um, so positive eugenics and negative eugenics. So when we think of eugenics, we usually think about sterilization um, and that would fall under negative eugenics. Um, and so that, and, and that is the story of violence that we have heard from you know, people across the US, across the world, um, and of course, the science has since been totally debunked. Um, this is a nice little map um, that gives an idea about where uh, eugenic sterilization legislation was at around 1935. So everything in stripes had laws in effect by 1935. And those that are painted black were um, had bills pending. So this was like a this was like spreading across the United States. Um, and it was it was really popular and and it was it was a movement and, and that spilled into Hawaii as well. And we can see with these headlines up here the terminology that is really wrapped into eugenics discourse, like feeble-mindedness, um, mentally diseased, that was all kind of grouped together with conditions such as epilepsy and, and other things. Um, so the first time that I could find that the concept of eugenics was uh, brought into Hawaii, which was for a paper that was read at the Social Science Society of Hawaii. And I don't know a lot about this society. I know that it was sort of um, a periodic gathering of social elites, men, um, in Hawaii that I think, you know, included, well, it was white men and then some Kanaka men. And in 1886, a paper was read called What is Eugenics? And it really just sort of, it was, it was very uh, nebulous still in its definition. And it was sort of talking about, um, you know, the, the social, the, the evolution into kind of social theory of, of, Darwin. And then in 1888, it comes up again um, in a paper read at the same gathering um, by Sereno Bishop called Why Are Hawaiian People Dying Out? So in Hawaii, um, eugenics is also couched within a narrative that begins when the missionaries arrive, and it's still going today, and that is one of uh, Hawaiian extinction. Yeah, it is developed today. I'll talk about later in, in different forms. It's not so much physical, but um, but that is that is the framework through which eugenics is always taking place, and we'll we'll get to more of that in a bit. And then here's just some um, verbiage from from the thing. Let me see. I gotta move. Turn that move can't see my whole, there we go. So the paper asks, in what respects particularly and precisely are the Hawaiians weaker than their white or their mongoloid guests? This is the language that the paper uses. But it's all like, what, what, what's going on with the Hawaiians? Why, why can't they make it? You know, what is, what is particular about the Hawaiian race that makes them not be able to thrive? Um, 
Okay. And then we have to we have to move through this to get to the territorial period. But shortly after this concept is introduced, then we go into a time of high political unrest in the Hawaiian kingdom. Of course, in January 1893, there's an armed invasion of the kingdom, landing um, US naval and marine troops to overthrow Queen Liliuokalani. We know that there is near universal opposition to annexation to the United States. So we're talking about like a, a full national resistance to what is happening politically and to the takeover by the sugar planters and, and um, resistance to a loss of sovereignty yeah, or to any sort of absorption into the United States. So while we usually, you know, kind of that story a lot of the times ends at the, um, the illegal annexation, it doesn't mean that the people went away, right? That all the Hawaiian citizens, the Hawaiian people, and it doesn't mean that the um, antagonism went away. Um, so there's a lot of anxieties around um, Kanaka Maoli on those national fronts, but then also the increasing Asian labor force that is being subjected to slave-like abusive conditions um, on the plantation. And there's a lot of anxiety around those folks too. Um, and then moving into um, the territorial period, which officially begins, I guess, in 1900, this is when Theodore Roosevelt comes to power and he's really sort of pushing this mantra of race suicide, which is another narrative that's being built up around in the United States as immigrant labor is coming into the United States, as um, you know, war efforts are ramping up as, as sort of the imperialist US is getting its legs. Um, and the good white boy is going off to war. Um, Let's see, do I have, yeah. So, so race suicide is this um, expression of white anxiety of becoming a minority in the United States of losing power and, you know, we're living it again now. So it's not that difficult to um, connect to this sort of widespread anxiety that's happening in the United States at this time. But this term race suicide is actually also being pushed out by um, Theodore Roosevelt. So to give to paint a little picture and context in territorial Hawaii, um, during the, the course of decades where eugenics, where there's an effort to implement eugenics legislation and, and efforts and different things in Hawaii, this is a time of, the more I dig into this because my current research is the same period, this is a time of, it reminds me of now. You know, ter the territorial period for, for us in our minds is like this, this sort of like mystery, right? This opaque mystery of a period, like especially Hawaiian studies, we just obsess over the kingdom and then it's like the annexation. And then we kind of jump to, you know, the seventies with the, the, the land um, struggles and, and sort of the birth of the modern Hawaiian movement, right? But territorial Hawaii was nuts. <laughs> It was such a crazy time. The labor movement alone was enough to make any capitalists, uh, you know, not be able to sleep in anxiety and fear every single night. The people were rising up. Um, these are pictures of, you know, the a uh, sugar strike of 1946, I think it was. Below that is the Hilo massacre, 1938. Um, the, the Massey case happens in 1930, and there's these real, you know, which is, it, which is such a clear expression of these um, incredible racial tensions that sort of fall along lines of the dominated and the, and, the, and the dominating. And then we still have Hawaiians who are struggling for power and, and sort of um, in different degrees of antagonism with the oligarchy. Um, 
it's important to think about when we when we get into this curriculum that this generation of students that are at Kamehameha schools when this curriculum is taught, they're the first generation born after the overthrow. It's that generation of kids. So these are the children of the parents of the people who signed the anti-annexation petitions, right? Um, what, are, what are we gonna do? Um, we have a predominantly Kanaka Mali legislature a um, couple decades into the territory, certainly at the time when the first round of legislation was introduced for eugenics. Um, so this is a, a really, territorial Hawaii is a really politically wild time. Uh, you know, just, it, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's decades of rising up of, of working so hard to lift up the oppressed. Was it all perfect? No. Was there all kinds of weird compromises and, and things that, you know, um, we can look back on and analyze, of course. But this was a time where the territorial oligarchy had every reason to be nervous all the way through. Um, okay, a little bit about just how eugenics took its form in territorial Hawaii. So it was through legislation. Um, this is outside of the purview of my research, but I I could see it in some of the documents that I looked at, so I hope someone picks it up. But um, in private practice, doctor's offices, it took the form of institutionalization. So the Waimano home, Waimano home, everybody's familiar with that um, in Hawaii. It was founded in 1921 as the Waimano home for the feeble-minded. Whenever you hear feeble-minded in this area, it's directly linked to eugenics. Of course, sterilization, something we're pretty familiar with, with eugenics, and then the educational piece, which is going to be the focus of the rest of this talk. So, and then just a little, little more detailed timeline. So in 1913, two eugenics bills were introduced into the territorial legislature. One was um, to receive a marriage license, you would have to sort of uh, go through an examination of your fitness for reproduction. Um, and the other one was to sterilize, and this is this is the um, this is actually the name of the bill. Sterilization of the feeble, feeble-minded persons, epileptics, rapists, certain criminals, and other defectives. Um, you can see the scope and range of who they were wanting to, you know, be able to cast a net over in terms of. Uh, qualifying for sterilization. And, and this bill meant that if you were found to be any of these things, you could be court ordered towards to sterilization. These bills both died directly along ethnic lines. So every white person in the territorial legislature voted yes. And every Hawaiian, with the exception of one, voted no, and they died. Um, so those did not pass. In 1915, um, eugenics for parents and teachers. So this is actually a follow-up to the curriculum I'm gonna look at, which I think came out in 1913 as well. Um, so after eugenics for young people comes out for the boys and girls of Kamehameha schools, a supplemental pamphlet comes out in 1915 called eugenics for parents and teachers. In 1920, Waimano Home for the Feeble Minded was established. And I'm just putting some of these things in here to, to keep the context in focus. 1933, another sterilization bill that was backed by, and this kind of gives you a sense of the network, the oligarchic network in Hawaii, was backed by the director of Queens Hospital, the director of Palama Settlement, the Deputy Attorney General, the Board of Prison Directors, and the Superintendent of Waimano Home. It was another sort of compulsory sterilization bill, and it also did not pass. Okay, so eugenics kind of gains traction in territorial Hawaii through the Medical Association of Hawaii. And this is made up of, um, you know, folks whose names we're really familiar with, Castle, Cook, Dole, and others. 
Um, and they're, they're sort of the ones that usher in uh, a more serious look and effort for, for eugenics. So shoot, I'm like blocking my own, hold on. Okay. Um, right, my, my little view screen of y'all is like in my way. Okay. All right. Um, so in 1911, um, the Medical Association of Hawaii holds an annual meeting. And if somebody, I see um, Anne-Marie on here and Joy can go find their archives, that is going to be a treasure trove. I couldn't find their archive. Um, the Medical Association of Hawaii holds their annual meeting and they invite this guest speaker John T. McDonald. He's a self-described eugenicist, and in his words, arriving at a knowledge of proper qualifications and requirements for parenthood, with a view always to a better and worthier race by the gradual elimination of the unfit. In his talk, he lays out, and his talk is, is available, it is in the archives here in Hawaii, um, I think at Hamilton. Um, he lays out, you know, what is this, what the definition of unfit, basically. So he lists all of these things and I just bullet pointed them here. So thieves, embezzlers, chronic gamblers, the drunkard, the recovering alcoholic, epileptics, the feeble-minded, congenital deaf, degenerates, criminals, and paupers. So what eugenics is, is, is the argument that all of these folks they are this because of genetics and that they are therefore going to pass that down um, to their, you know, to their posterity and that we need to kind of eliminate that from happening so that we can get rid of all thieves, drunkards and paupers, poor people. Um, we can see how this really has nothing to do with biology um, and that we have to think about the social conditions that were taking place and how those even fell along racial lines, you know, gendered lines, um, where, where indigeneity comes here and other forms of marginalization. Um, Elof Axel Carlson, who wrote A Century of Eugenics in America from the Indiana Experiment to Human, um, to human, to the Human Genome Era, so he takes it fully into now, just like the exhibit does and Kielu Fox's work does. Um, he talks about degeneracy theory and that this is something that um, really blew up at this time and got popular. And he writes that degeneracy theory found its origins in the boom bust economy. Accidents, ill health and tragedies of life, the loss of a spouse, becoming orphaned, being in an abusive home environment, could also lead to unreliability at work or unemployment compounded the structural economic challenges that strained American life. It goes on to say that, um, that this theory was holding that the physiological imperfections that led to degeneracy were themselves mark of an, mark of an individual's inherent biological inferiority. So he, he makes the argument and paints the picture that this was about making the economy hum and those who were not fitting into the you know the sort of capitalist production that that employer class um the oligarchic class in hawaii was trying to get moving um they were an impediment and and that that's what you know that's what this was actually about and I think everybody, you know, it's hard for me, I can't see everybody's, you know, reactions, but like, you can just see how absurd these labels are, um, but also how scary it is that this was, you know, the breadth of the net that they were trying to cast for the unfit. Um, okay. Yeah, and I, and I did include this because we we literally had tenements, you know, in Honolulu at this time. But in his talk, he also says that eugenics would bear its greatest fruit 
upon the great toiling masses, especially in the crowded tenement quarters of our great cities where we find high birth rates and may we add correspondingly high death rates. So there is like, I mean, I'm gonna point out sort of the, the native aspect of the curriculum, but this eugenics discourse is just like, it's constantly about economy and class. Get rid of the poor, get, get rid of those who are suffering, get rid of anybody who is not like helping the machine work. So this is, this is all from the talk that he gave in 1911 here in Hawaii. Okay, so we're gonna get a little bit into, um, well, actually, before we get into eugenics for young people, I, I wanted to share a couple pieces from, this is 1903, so this is going back a little bit in my slides. But in 1903, I pulled the um, territorial uh, report of the territorial governor to, I think it's the Department of Interior, but it's to, um, it's, a, it's a federal report that was coming out of territorial Hawaii. And it's from 1903 and it's, and it's really clear um, the anxiety that they are experiencing. So the report begins by laying out a racial makeup of Hawaii. Um, and, then it, and then it communicates those anxieties and it reads, at this rate, it says, at this rate, unless there should be a larger immigration of American settlers than now seems probable, the present numerical inferiority of those which may be classed as belonging to the Teutonic race will in a few years become a still greater inferiority as compared with the then American citizens of the Hawaiian, Portuguese, Japanese, and Chinese races. So he's saying like, we got this many Hawaiian, Portuguese, Japanese, and Chinese now, um, within a few years, and especially as they have children who are then American citizens, they, they say the Teutonic race. I don't know why they choose Teutonic, but the white race will be even more of an inferiority in terms of numbers than they are, than we are now. We speaking from the writer's point of view. Um, and then it goes on to say, this prospect emphasizes the importance of giving to all children who are American citizens a good common school education. The association of pupils of different races with each other in school work and the recreation of the playground go far toward breaking down racial prejudices and tends to prepare them for intelligent political action in the future. So this, this part's actually a little bit funny because they're saying that, you know, if the races start breaking down their differences and working together, it goes far toward intelligent political action. And boy, were they were correct because when the plantations and the, the laborers started uh, reaching across races, they became the biggest headache for um, the power holders of Hawaii, I would say almost to date. Um, so that kind of backfired. But the, the point of including that in this presentation is that they had their sights set on education, right? They had to educate the young people or, I mean, and these were the children of, like I said, people who resisted the American takeover of Hawaii and the children of those who were being abused by those who took over Hawaii on the plantations and in different fields of labor. Okay, so getting into the curriculum, um, Eugenics for Young People is the name of it. It's a pamphlet. It's pretty small. I, I believe it's also at Hamilton in the Hawaiian collection. Um, and I, I didn't put this together. This, I guess it didn't really matter to me until I saw the exhibit that Kamehameha schools share the campus with Bishop Museum. Once I saw that Bishop Museum as its own sort of, you know, institution was also engaging in this sort of like race politics um, and this race science, it, it just kind of, I don't know, it, it, it hit heavier. It was written by Aldrich Thompson, who was a teacher for a couple of decades at Commitment Schools for Boys. And he, was, he also served for a short period as one of the vice principals. He also taught it. Um, it was 12 chapters long and it was taught once a week to the fifth sixth and seventh grade boys. Okay, so my daughter's in fifth grade. So that's like 10, 11, 12, 13. 
at that age. Okay. So we know, we kind of know what that means in terms of a child's mind. I mean, it was endorsed and it's signed by, and it, and it has their names on the curriculum itself by the Medical Association of Hawaii. So this wasn't just some one-off thing that some, some single dude at Kamehameha schools like wrote. This was like vetted and produced by those throughout the network of the territorial oligarchy. And it focused as we'll see on difference and disconnection of students from their ancestors. Okay, so I'm just gonna go through some excerpts now um, from the curriculum. And we're gonna be kind of now coming into the sort of indigenous piece, um, the national piece, the way that eugenics is articulated in particular to Hawaiian boys. So in chapter one, the curriculum uh, gives a definition for eugenics and they couch it within sociology, sociologists, what kind of people live in a country, in a city, a part of a city, how much they're educated, how much they earn, you know, how many saloons are in that place. And if you can find, you know, if you can research and, and figure out all of that, then a sociologist, Thompson says, can tell you what will happen to that country to move. Um, what will happen to that country. Um, and then I think notably highlighted in yellow there, whether they're capable of becoming good citizens and whether their children will become better citizens or poorer citizens than their fathers and mothers. And then it says so sociology is also a study to improve human beings in every way. And then I don't, but I shall not call it sociology because sociology is too big a subject. I shall call it eugenics. Only a teacher who has all power over fifth, sixth, and seventh graders shall say, I shall call it and then call it something. But whatever the case, you can see that this is an issue of national character, national allegiance, expectations of citizenry, right? Um, and this is being taught to the children of those who absolutely oppose becoming American citizens. And now, and you know, the discourse of ancestry is is all throughout this um, this curriculum. And I really gotta move away. Okay. So in chapter two, um, it goes on to state: in most of us, the good qualities of one ancestor have combined with the bad qualities of another ancestor. This makes us not so good as our best ancestors. This is the message that the kids are getting right off the bat. And this is absolutely, this is why I include things like in my bio that my daughter goes to Kekula Kayapunio Anoi Noi. This is the absolute opposite of what we teach our keiki now. Um, and we have to reclaim the sense of disconnection. Um, chapter four is called To a Remnant. Okay, so that remnant are the children here of Kamehameha schools. It says, Hawaiians possessed many of the finest qualities mankind is heir to. It is shown by what they did. I made a nice little table so we don't have to read what he says. So he goes on to list the qualities um, and then, you know, his examples that he gives. So Hawaiian children, the great examples of, you know, the great qualities of their ancestors were that they were gigantic in um, stature and great in strength. They were courageous, their big voyages, their battles, their sport. They were patient and preserving. Um, they were industrious, honest and hospitable and intelligent. So it's, these aren't necessarily bad things, but you don't see anything in here in terms of the political accomplishments <laughs> that their ancestors made happen in the 19th century before them, right? The fact that they secured sovereignty and independence in a colonial frenzy, a global colonial frenzy, right? That they 
um, you know, that they self that they self governed for hundreds and hundreds of years, the sophisticated political systems. It's it's things that are safe to tell the children to connect to, right? None of it is about political power um, in the political context that they were living in. Chapter nine, and I don't, I, I kind of skip around here a little bit, but chapter nine, and here's where one of the pictures from the exhibit comes in, I think, um, I think I took this one, is called the elimination of the unfit. And the curriculum says, look about you. Everywhere you see lines becoming extinct through the slow moving merciless laws of nature. Such elimination has come to members of the strongest lines and such elimination may come to members of your line unless, and like it literally says that, unless, dash, unless. Um, so when I went to the exhibit and I saw this cast of a boy named Mamane Kiave Mauhili, this piece really hit home because when I'm reading this piece, as I was studying it and thinking about it, again, it's in the context of extinction, of Hawaiian extinction, right? And such elimination has come to members of the strongest lines. Thinking about lines is a very Hawaiian thing. That is very intentional language. We still obsess over genealogical lines, mo'oku al hao, right? And who are the strongest lines when we think about genealogy in a Hawaiian context. They're the ali'i lines. And so there is messaging in here that emphasizes the weakening or the extinction of ali'i lines. Yeah. And mamane kiave mauhili, when you, when you know <laughs> Hawaiian lines, and you see that name, Kiave Mauhili, that is a high chief. And when you read the story that is presented about this child, this student that's at this exhibit at the Bishop Museum, um, Mamane you know, goes on and I think becomes a firefighter, police officer, but eventually drops, drops his name, Kiave Mauhili, and takes Mamane as a last name. And that enrages me. And I'm not speaking for Mamane Kiave Mauhili. And I'm not saying that Mamane Kiave Mauhili was a victim to this discourse but it's something to take into consideration in terms of what our, our keiki were, were going through at that time. Okay. Oh yeah. There's the story that's presented. So born in Laie Oahu, one of seven children, a student at Kamehameha Schools for Boys in 1919 and 1920. He was active in both basketball and football, always encouraging like the physicality of Hawaiians. That was always acceptable and celebrated. Uh, by 1921, he left Kamehameha and no longer used the Kiawe Maohili name. He began his career in the Honolulu Fire Department, initially at the Central Fire Station got married, had two sons, later worked as a truck driver at, at the Kaimuki Fire Station um, near his home in Palolo. And at the time of his death, he was known as Jack Kiao Mamane. Um, sounds like he lived a great life. And I, and, I, and I have nothing negative to say about his life, but I do wanna place sort of that this discourse of disconnection from ancestors and the extinction of the strongest lines um, is something that I notice when I see that this boy sort of dropped his name. And I also, where this does come into my current research now is, um, is thinking about the way that Hawaiian workers were produced, Hawaiian laborers were produced. Um, and, you know, 
there's already kind of a lot of common knowledge about that around commitment schools. Um, but this, this also compels me to dig into that a little bit further. Okay, going back to chapter four to a remnant, and this is another image from the, um, the exhibit. And these are called, oh, I had, um, Jillian send me the name. They're called spreading, spreading. I forget if someone knows, just go ahead and say it, spreading shears. Um, but these, these were part of the, the um, you know, measuring heads and skulls. Um, that's all part of this sort of like race science. But I just thought that the term spreading, that they're spreading instruments. I'm like, gosh, that's so fitting because that's like what's, it's like there's these things that are being wedged in between these students through this curriculum and their ancestors. And it's to kind of like pull them apart. Um, but back to, to a remnant, it says, where now are those men of strength and endurance of courage and pers perseverance? Most of that stock was killed off in the wars or died from disease and drink introduced by the white men. Worst of all, most of them died without having reproduced their kind. Also a nod to the elite lines is what that is. And humanity is just that much poorer. Um, the, the curriculum goes on to lay out now, not just, you know, okay, you guys are just a remnant of these great ancestors of the past, none of whom excelled in uh, self-governance, by the way. Um, but here's where we want you to kind of start thinking about what makes um, that good citizen, right? What is ideal and what is unfavorable? So he has this whole section that lays out the environment. And you can just see how like class um, permeates through this language as well. And, and again, to always think about like the, you know, the stories of the tenements in Honolulu, the burning down of Chinatown, the, the labor struggles, um, and the impacts of dispossession for Hawaiians. Um, you could go one way, or if you find yourself being impacted in this other way, you know, then, um, then we might wanna talk about elimination. But for, for environment, clean and comfortable home, friends with good ideals, wholesome food and plenty of it, well-trained to some kind of work, Employment where the air is good, surroundings are clean and sanitary, and the hours are not too long. This, in a sense, is also messaging to Hawaiians to, yes, you want to go find, you know, um, it, it's not that it's so much you want to go find these jobs, like in the fire department or in the police department, these sort of like, you know, mid-range jobs. It's more so you want to differentiate yourself from those who are working in harsher conditions, right? And, and to internalize that these things are biological and natural. They're not part of a social construct. The unfavorable, not enough food. I mean, this is just about poverty, honestly. Um, work in a place where the air is bad and the hours are long. Children are allowed to spend time on the street. So you get the idea here. And then the, the curriculum asks, why do the middle and upper classes take so much trouble with their children? And it lays out sort of these different experiences for children. On the one hand, they're taught principles of industry and honesty. They're clean and sober. Send children to school and college. Keep them morally clean and prepare them for a useful life. On the other hand, not so good. Um, they go to the factory, right, to help make some money for their family. They have there's alcoholism in their home. Um, and they can't expect to be clever, moral, thrifty, clean, or sober. And so this also messages to these kids, like whatever your situation, you find yourself struggling with alcohol. I mean, as you are going through like the most like e extreme political upheaval, you know, in your people's history, um, it's because you just can't cut it. You know, it's you. This, this is such a liberal idea, individualist idea. This is about you and your inability and your, you know, you, your inherent incapability of succeeding. 
Okay, and then back to chapter, chapter nine, the elimination of the unfit. So Aldrich Thompson basically lays out that there's two methods towards the elimination of the unfit, nature and science. And here's how he kind of defines that. So he, he lists the um, cold, hunger, unemployment, and unemployability as um, nature taking its course to eliminate the unfit. And he goes on to tell them, if one of my lines shall become degenerate, either through accident or through some foolish act of his own, I want science to end that part of my line right there. So according to this ideology, nature are all of the sort of social conditions one can find them, one who is on the margins can find themselves in. And if it kills them, that's nature, that's natural. However, there's also this scientific method, which is basically sterilization. And he's saying, hey, even if it was my line, like sterilize them. And this one is just such a kicker. What is your wish for the unfortunate ones that may come in your line? You who believe in the present system of laissez-faire. <laughs> I don't mean to laugh. I usually cry and I don't know why I'm not crying, but like, I just, it's just so blatant, right? So laissez-faire economics, unbridled capitalism. I mean, it's just so clear. The unfortunate ones that may come in your line those who believe in the present system of capitalism. And he's putting that, that question on fifth, sixth and seventh grade boys, you know, if your kids aren't cutting it, if your kids aren't cutting it in this new system, then what I would do is wish to end that part of my line right there. Um, that, pretty much concludes the, the look at the, um, the curriculum itself. Again, it's just, it's little snapshots. There's nothing kind of dishonest about what I pulled out and what I did not pull out. You can access the curriculum yourself. Um, it's all, it's all that stuff. Um, I did want to, although this is not the focus, I did want to just show the numbers of Waimano Home. So now that we kind of have a better understanding of this idea of unfitness, um, this is master's research. I, I have to unshare my screen to get her name. I forget her name, but it's on. It's available online too and through UH um, theses and dissertations. But it was a master's thesis on Y model home, and these are the numbers, you know, kind of broken down by ethnicity. So 1920 and 21 Hawaiians are overrepresented. Um, by 20%. Caucasians and interestingly Japanese are very underrepresented. Um, and then the numbers fluctuate 1930, 5.8 overrepresentation, 1940, 22.1. That's a very interesting fluctuation. Um, and then Japanese become less underrepresented, which I would kind of expect considering all of the trouble that our Japanese comrades were making in the labor movement. Um, and Caucasians even become, oh no, they become more underrepresented. Okay. So, um, you know, one of the ways that I think about what was going on and how it ties to today is by thinking about the message of Olaho that the missionaries brought to Hawaii. And olaho, in the most literal, literal translation, is new life. Um, but the missionaries were the first ones to come and, and say that inherent aspects of being Hawaiian are the reason you're dying. Yeah, they're the reason. Uh, it's your promiscuity. It's your wars. It's your political system. Um, it's your hula these are the reasons why you are dying off and if you want to live you need to bury those things they need to die and you can be reborn through christianity that's what the missionaries had to offer 
in this context, it's that you are not fitting into this, this new hyperproductive, laissez-faire capitalist system. And whatever it is that is causing you to not fit into that, whether it's your pain, whether it's marginalization, whether it is your family's politics, you have a choice. You either assimilate or, in other words, you bury those things and you can be reborn through assimilation, right? We have the answer. And we see this over and over and over again um, in all of the political issues that we currently live through. The TMT is couched in a discourse of um, educational destitution, right? The Pueo group, which is sort of the, the token small Hawaiian group that just loudly advocates for the TMT on Hawaii Island. All of their advocacy is couched in the, the poor lack of educational opportunities of the poor Hawaiians in Keokaha. You know, um, if we are going to deny the 30 meter telescope and the desecration of Mauna Kea, then we are denying, we are denying saving ourselves from our own inability to be an intellectually thriving people. We get that when we resist geothermal um, because we need more energy. We need more sustain, you know, we need more green energy in Hawaii. We get that when we resist the windmills. It's always that we are being offered that which will save us if we would only take the hand of the capitalist. Um, it goes back to, I wish I, I wish I had it or printed out. Um, you know, Gugi Watiango talks about the cultural bomb. They take away our language. They take away our, our memory of ourselves. They take away our sense of history of ourselves. And that's the cultural bomb. And it creates this, this sort of mental wasteland and then on top of that, they, they want us to start singing the refrain that theft is holy. Right? Um, but I brought it back to these pictures because it's not, you know, again, it's not just the boys of Kamehameha schools. This is couched in political resistance um, and political antagonism that was there then and that remains, remains here now. Um, as we see in 2019 alone. And I included these pictures that were, you know, had the police in them um, because I, I, I do want to talk about um, the discussions around abolishing the police right now. And in order for us to really be able to start talking about that because we have so many Hawaiians and local people in the police force, we have to be able to historicize the police as well. and and know that when we look at that eugenics for young people curriculum, going into the police force could save you from extinction, could give you a decent living, right? Go this way, don't go this way. You need to go this way and you need to help us fight the Hawaiians and suppress the Hawaiians who are rising up in this way. Um, so we have to talk about the way that uh, the occupation of Hawaii and the economic system has um, interpolated us in, in different ways um, to, you know, have a real honest discussion about uh, abolition in Hawaii as well. Um, so it's, it's, I'm, I'm grateful to be able to go back to my research and to go back to this curriculum because having lived through, you know, 2019 and the ongoing issues and the ongoing killings that we're seeing in our community as well. Um, and this, you know, really difficult debate that is just trying to kind of reach the surface in Hawaii, um, that curriculum and the messaging that was, that was being given to those boys does help us historicize um, these difficult relationalities that we're trying to grapple with right now. 
going to leave it there. I hope I didn't go. No, I think I did okay. And yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Alima. That was really fantastic. I um, have, we have about a half hour that we can do questions and I'm gonna open it up to questions in a moment. I do first wanna just acknowledge a couple things that I really appreciated in your talk. Um, first, just to say like, I really admire that you can dive into this history so deeply uh, and so regularly and be able to come out and take so much meaning and, and just share that meaning and that knowledge with us. It is uh, incredible and, and really grateful that you're willing to do that work. Um, thank you also for acknowledging the bus of the Kamehameha School students. Uh, we, we mentioned and we've talked about how that was a really challenging decision for us to show them um, because we weren't able to work with families on that. And so I'm really grateful that you were able to, to add more to that story. Um, also to extend the conversation on eugenics because in our exhibit, we really focus on this racial aspect and it's really important um, and, and thank you for, for bringing this into the conversation that it's so much more beyond just the racial question that it impacts so many communities. Thank you for bringing that to the fore. And especially for talking about the interconnectedness of these things and driving home the importance of history and the connections, especially to race, class and capitalism for really effectively showing those ties, um, especially when there's a lot of investment uh, from some parties in, in trying to maintain those as invisible. Um, so, so thank you. And in that spirit, I'm just gonna ask one question that came to my mind, which was thinking about your current work. And I was wondering if you'd be able to share a little bit about your current dissertation work and how that, if, I guess I'm making an assumption, if and how that kind of springs from the work that you've been sharing with us today and, and, and what that says about the past and today connected. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm still thinking through a lot of it, but one thing is one thing I know is that we um, Kanaka Mali have been largely written out of the the labor history, and there's a robust labor history literature that comes out of Hawaii. And on the one hand, um, it is supposed to almost be raceless because that was the sort of triumph. Of, triumph of Hawaii labor in the territorial period was to be like, we're not going to let you divide us by race anymore. We're all brothers under the skin, you know, and we're going to like rise up together and, and win. And they did. But on the other hand, the literature, you know, does focus on Japanese, Filipino, um, you know, and some others. And there's nothing specifically Hawaiian about the those who are really involved in labor. So, um, so the point I'm getting at is that there were a ton of Hawaiians involved in the militant side of the labor movement in the territorial period. And so this is a story of resistance that we don't really, I think that we don't really have on our radars as a Lahui. Um, and because we don't have that on our radars, we're not thinking about, I mean, I can talk about why I think that that's not on our radar, but that's, it'll take too long. But the impact of that not having, not having that on our radar is um, we're very disconnected, I think in terms of the, the Hawaiian movement in thinking about a pilina and, and the possibilities of that with labor, even though we still make up such a huge part of the laboring workforce. Um, and, you know, um, it also just adds to that mis mystique for Hawaiians of what happened in the territory, what happened back then. Um, so, so yeah, so part of it is, is to develop more of that context of eugenics, say, um, but also looking at like that specific line about the messaging in eugenics to the youth of that time about like, this is the class line, you wanna go down this route, this one is bad, you know? And, and, and then grappling with the fact that we've always had Hawaiians in the police forces um, and in certain 
certain other segments of the workforce, right? But not, you know, they were not developing the engineers and, you know, the 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 big leaders um, at Kamehameha schools. It was, it, there was definitely like a ceiling that you weren't supposed to go beyond, but this is good, right? And we don't want you to go, we don't want you to get involved with these Hawaiians over here, they're bad. Um, and I think that even some of the, you know, I think there were, when you look at the divide amongst the, the police during the Massey case, it's not even just to say that all Hawaiians, you know, were always just there protecting capital. Like there was a lot of complexity, but we have to be able to get to that um, in order to, to kind of really tackle today's issues. So yeah, I really just, you know, I'm, I'm a Hawaiian studies, I'm a Hawaiian studies person, so I will always be obsessed and committed to recovering history for us, um, history that was erased during that time. When I asked my dad, when I started taking Hawaiian studies, how come you never told us any of this, dad? And his response was, oh, I was shamed to be Hawaiian. It was shamed to be Hawaiian growing up. Well, that's that comes from that era. So that's what took me down this path. But my dad's also a big labor guy, right? So he, he was able to latch onto the labor, but not the Hawaiian, what happened. So. That's, that's, I guess, all how it kind of um, mixes together for me. Cool, thank you. thank you for sharing. And I'm really looking forward to seeing this project as it develops as well. Um, I pulled a few of the, the questions from chat. So I guess we can start from those. Um, the first one I thought we could do is, is from Faith. Uh, were girls also taught eugenics? Um, well, the, I'll say this much. The curriculum said, uh, so the cover page, it says eugenics for young people. And then you open it up. The title page says eugenics for young people, a curriculum for the boys and girls of Kamehameha schools. Um, I focused my details on the boys because that's what I could find in the Kamehameha school archives. And I forget her name. I know, I know there's people on here that remember her name. Who is the old archivist at Kamehameha schools? It starts with a Z. She retired now. Anyways, she didn't even believe me when I went in there. She was like, she had her own method and it was all crazy inside there. And only she knew where everything was. She didn't believe me that this, this was a thing, that this happened. And then we, start, we started opening up the curriculum manuals or records or whatever. And then boom, we found it. But we only found it, um, we only found it, we only looked at the boys, I guess. So it was taught to girls. I think it was intended to at least. But that's a whole nother tip of the iceberg that we need somebody on here to pick up is looking at what was being taught to the girls because the girls were being taught how to iron. The girls were being taught domesticity that was right in alignment with, you know, those charts that I showed in my presentation, but the, the, the gender sort of female side of the middle class expectations. Uh, I I also, yes, to, yeah, I also wanted to take this opportunity to say everybody's microphones are enabled. And so also in Q&A, if you have a question and you want to voice it, please do that. Um, happy to make this a conversation. I have one from Lemomi Oaks that I thought was interesting, a sort of statistical question. Uh, going back to the Waimano Homes data, uh, what was the population of Waimano Home at this time? I would imagine it was small enough that even a couple of people might make a huge difference in the percentages. Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. A smart question. I don't know the answer to it. Um, but what I can do now is look up the name of the woman who wrote that thesis if someone wants to follow up. Um, and you're absolutely right. But I, I'm sorry, I, I don't know the answer to that right now. And then the last question I have from chat is, is kind of, I guess, related in terms of um, <laughs> legwork and looking up sources. So Matthew McConnell asks, where can we access the curriculum or other primary sources uh, that you've used in your work? And also thank you so much for doing this. It's incredible work. The curriculum itself is in the Hawaiian collection at Hamilton Library. I believe I also saw a copy of it at the State Archives. Um, I 
can't tell you if it's at Kamehameha Schools archives or not, but that's a harder archive to access anyways, but it's at, it's at the Hawaiian collection. So look up Kapena Shim, you can track it down for you. He's the head librarian of the Hawaiian collection or just go in there and, and they can pull it for you. And, and it's, you know, it's, it's a pamphlet more than like a big book. So you can easily scan the whole thing in like 10 minutes. Um, the, the talk by John T. McDonald, that's also, I think I got most of this stuff at the Hamilton Library um, and the State Archives. Are there any other questions from the crowd? How long did this instruction go on at Kamehameha Schools? Let me look, I think I have that. Okay, real quick though, her, um, the person who wrote the thesis, her name is Karen Reiko Takemoto and the name of her master's thesis is Unquestionably Lolo, A History of Waimanaho 1921 to 1961 and it's a master's thesis. And how long did it go for? Go back. I'm sorry, I met the, the instruction on eugenics yeah. at Kamehameha schools, at the schools at Kamehameha. Okay, it, oh, okay, I don't have it on there. That was something that Janet and I looked for. She couldn't mm. find all of the curriculum manuals, but we're, I think we made it all like through the early 20s. Um, so that's, that's sort of a, a data piece that someone else needs to kind of pick up and, and finish up that research. Um, the last, but like I said, there was huge legislation, like a big push for that, that legislation. The second big one was 1933. So if I were to go search the archives, I would be looking for at least through then. And then the third big push, I think was in 1950 or 1955. And that was also, they all died, you know, and um, all of those pieces of legislation died with a fight. I think the first one, there was no fight. It was just like, yeah, no. The other one, there was harder lobbying and, and a stronger fight. And I, I, I can't remember which Trask, but right, one of the, um, the Trask grandfather or Honeniki's grandfather, uncle was a territorial senator and, and he lobbied against that last bill too in like 50 or 55. Um, so that's also kind of like an interesting piece. I mean, sorry, let me get back to your question. The, the, the move toward like compulsory sterilization or, or the, the, the brightness of eugenics on the mind of certain powerful people in Hawaii lasted into the 50s. So I don't know, we couldn't find exactly where it ends, but it could have gone that long. It could have gone longer. It could have gone shorter. Um, perhaps it just went as long as, you know, Aldrich Thompson was teaching, but yeah. So Kathleen's question. Um, I'm looking at the history. Oh yeah, sorry. I answered that like whole other question from Jillian and maybe no one even knows my research. Is. I'm looking at the history of the formation of the Hawaiian stevedores um, from when they form, when they form organize in an organized manner in the 1860s until um, they achieve, you know, a collective bargaining union in 1935 with the formation of the ILWU. But there's sort of like a militant faction that comes out of Hilo. Hilo's always the militant ones. Um, and then there's a, a, a more, a less militant faction that's coming out of Honolulu. But that's kind of holding boundaries in, in ways that is kind of against the grain of the real powerful union movement at that time. So I'm, I'm kind of looking at both of those. But I'm also looking for the, the particular, you know, there's there's little bits and pieces in the labor literature that talk about Hawaiians, you know, signing up for the union or even signing up for the communist party, uh, like by asking, um, are we gonna get our land back if we do this? And they're like, yep, that'll be our first priority. Okay, sign me up. 
So um, I'm, I'm looking for the Aloha Aina articulations within um, union organizers um, and members in the territorial period. Yeah, Chase, that's a great question. And someone should definitely do that research as well. If there are simil similar curricula used in the public schools at the time. Kumeme schools gave me a pretty, you know, easy snapshot case study kind of in how was this being articulated to Hawaiians in particular. Um, so that's why that's why I chose that one. But the real question is what were all of the keiki being taught across the board at that time, right? Because that's where the stories of our grandparents being beaten, come out of the public schools and Kamehameha schools for speaking Hawaiian. You know, that's where we see those Americanization curriculum, curricula coming out that are specifically to teach the kids the patriotic songs, the patriotic chants or mantras or, you know, whatever the flag salute is, is categorized as, all of those things. So, and you can think back to that territorial legis that territorial report, federal report saying like, it's all about the schools. It's all about the schools. We've got to renationalize them. And they make it about ethnicity because to them it's about ethnicity, right? Because they are looking through a framework of white supremacy. And these are all people that are lower than and less than, right? But it was more than that, even for the Japanese, even for the Chinese, even for the Filipino, and most definitely for the Hawaiians. There was there, there were so many, and this is where you got to look to the labor movement to find this. There were so many who understood that this was a tool of empire, that this was one of the, the you know, the wheels of empire and that there, there were people, you know, in the territorial period across the so-called races as, you know, these guys called them or considered them that were thinking about their resistance on an internationalist scale. So there's a national piece that, that comes out there. It's, I think it's most obvious with Hawaiians, um, but, you know, um, some of the great and famed labor leaders were also articulating their resistance to the capitalist class along those lines as well, that were not Hawaiian. Um there was the question about the, um, did the girls get taught this as well? And you mentioned how domestically focused the girls curriculum was. Do you think there was a link between that domestic focus and eugenics, at least here in New Zealand, the eugenics um, movement strongly believed that women were not capable of higher education and that it detracted from their ability to be good mothers. Um, so eugenics education in New Zealand was heavily focused on learn to iron, don't learn to do math. You think that affected the curriculum at Bishop schools for girls? Well, what I can speak to, because I know that there were Hawaiians who went on to UH. I don't know where they came from, if they came from Kamehameha schools or somewhere else. And I, and they, they were a marginal in number. Um, but the, not the eugenics curriculum, but the overall curriculum for Kamehameha schools for girls when it was that was always about um, domestic, the domestic arts, you know, um, sewing. Yeah. The idea was for them to be the, the caretakers at home. Now, another way to look at that question is to look at how women were going and entering into places like Waimano Home, which was through, to use their terms, promiscuity, right? So you had women who were like 
falling outside of the Victorian notions of womanhood um, were the ones that were um, being labeled, you know, the idiot, the idiot, moron, those labels to measure their intelligence level. But that was often linked to if they were not married, if they were being found at the bars, if they were, you know, involved in prostitution. Um, so someone needs to pick up that tip of that iceberg and, and take it a lot farther in Hawaii. But, um, but you don't have to dig too far to, to see that men were being um, constructed as sexual monsters, right? And sexually dangerous. That's what the Massey case is about. And women um, as sort of promiscuous and you know, those who were undomesticatable um, could find themselves uh, incarcerated in Waimano home. So I can, I can kind of talk around your question a little bit, but I'm sure it's very, very similar to what's happening in New Zealand. Question, question. Hi. Hi, hi, hi. Thank you for doing this. It's such an important topic. Um, my question is, I don't know if this relates to eugenics, but in the 1860s, the government, our government established a law that uh, regarding naming children when they were born. And it the law was that you had to have a, your first name had to be a Christian name your second name could be a, a Hawaiian name. And then there was all these convoluted things about if your mother was this and your father was this, you had to take this last name and last name. It was very complicated. So I, I don't know, it, it's, if I get the feeling that this is sort of eugenic-like in that if she, they're trying to take away our names. Our names are not even sufficient enough, our natural names. You have to change them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think where it connects is, um... I haven't studied the entire eugenics movement like all the way, but there was always an out for Hawaiians. That's what I find really interesting about the Hawaiian curriculum. It's like the choice is given, you know? So it, on the one hand, it's, it's couched in this narrative of the inevitability of the extinction of Hawaiians. And that goes beyond the eugenics discourse, right? That's like the discourse. Um, and on the other hand, in when you do get specific into eugenics, it's like, y'all know you're gonna die. Y'all know the Hawaiian race is dying out, right? But actually you might not if you have the correct name, you take the right career path, you stay out of you know these certain parts, corners of the, the community. You know, so it's like assimilation or die was kind of the message. Um, I just noticed that Anne Marie put her camera on, which makes me think she might have a, a question. Aloha, Ikehoa. Aloha. 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 Uh, such an illuminating experience um, personally and uh, in lots of other ways, just like reclaiming and understanding my kupuna. And, um, you know, you said something that I think I've been thinking about a lot, which was you talking to your dad about why he never shared any of those things. And that's a similar experience in my ohana as well. I know we have some similarities in our paths and I, um, you know, part being part of the exhibit, I uh, was having a hard time claiming my kupuna and I think a lot of what you shared tonight about the rhetorics that our, our, our parents and our grandparents were receiving during this territory period is something that I've been sort of thinking about a little bit more about how that trauma has passed on to us and how that um, that lack of knowledge and that lack of our, our, linear, our lineage um, has really affected our generation, the, uh, my generation and, and you know even generations a little bit before us. And so I just wanted to come on here and just, um, I, I started writing this really long chat and I decided I feel like I maybe articulate, my, articulate myself a little bit better. 
um, speaking to you directly that I just wanted to mahalo you for all this hard work. I, I've learned a lot being a part of this exhibit about eugenics that I never really understood before. And so this is has expanded my understanding of quite a bit more tonight. So mahalo nui yaoi, no kela, and no keiahana. Um, kupono keiahana nui, mahalo hoi. No, no more spreading calipers, right? We're getting rid of those out of our out of our mental our mental spaces. And and thank you for that, Anne Marie, and and for all of your work and for um for letting us into the story of your kupuna. You know, I stood with them. Joy and I both stood with them for a, a long time and read their stories in the exhibit. And you know. Just, it was, I mean, it was just such, such a wild time. It wasn't peaceful. It wasn't just Hawaiian homes and the civic clubs. It was like, eha, you know? And at the same time, there were still gangsters. Like I'm reading your kupuna stories and, you know, Nalani's kupuna stories. I'm like, our, our kupuna were always still just who they always have been and who we still are, you know? But that, um, that issue of, you know, claiming and stuff, you know, I, I think that even goes deep into our own ohana. My, my grandfather was a World War II vet, is a World War I, he passed away. And there's a split in my family. The conservatives, they claim him, you know, and how dare you, how dare you say these things about America or this or that, you know, Tutu, Tutu fought for this country. And I'm just like, you guys have no idea because you're not willing to look at the whole history, what he went through, you know? So what I do now is like, he's the one I bring with me to the most craziest spaces. And I'm like, I don't know if you like that I'm here or not, but you're going to be here with me and we're going to face this shit together, you know? So it's rough, you know? And it's, um, as you know, um, coming from your background, you know, in Hawaiian studies and, and now the work you do to provide the instruments through which we get to reconnect with our kupuna, my beloved archi archivist here on this, um, on this call, this is what we are, this is, we are doing the anti-work to what, what I presented on, you know, we're, we're actively resisting that and then it runs deep into our our own PD with our kupuna. So thank you for, for sharing that. Question? Mm -hmm. uh, can you say anything about the dialogue that was going on for a number of years about inter-ethnic breeding, breeding Hawaiians, literally breeding, bringing in Samoans and more Caucasians to marry and have children with Hawaiians to breed them out of their Hawaiianness. I've read um, a number of uh, newspaper mentions. Talk, are you talking talk, about like Kalakawa's Ho'oluluahui efforts and those things? No, no. Just uh, businessmen were, were saying, talking to another, each other and saying, you know, um, uh, the labor conditions are bad and we need, uh, we need, uh, the Hawaiians didn't want to work on the plantations and things, so they they were, were having this serious dialogue about importing people to breed with Hawaiians, so there would be less. They would be their progeny would become less and less Hawaiians by it by breeding with. They use that term breeding uh, with other races, Caucasian races. Yeah, I mean the um, that was that's that has always existed, and you know, as one of my current dissertation advisors, Craig Howes is sort of hammering home with me as he's like, it was always about labor, even with Kalakaua, it was about you know regenerating the population, but in a way that could also you know help boost a labor force um, for the growing plantations, and I'm like, don't tell me that. Um, I only want to be upset after the overthrow, no, no, no. but, uh, 
you know, the part of the part of the race sciences and eugenics and, and the things that are on display at the Bishop Museum, they're they are analyzing work habits, you know, what they characterize as work characteristics. So the Chinese fit into that a certain way, the Japanese fit into that a certain way, the Hawaiians fit into that a certain way. No matter what, though, all of those races have something to be extremely sus suspicious about from the white race science point of view, right? There's always a way to keep them at a distance and you got it, you know, to justify surveillance and uh, discipline and things like that. Um, in terms of mixing Hawaiians, I mean, I don't know, Kalakaua, there, there's, different, there's different ways to look at it. I do not believe that Kalakaua was just trying to produce a labor force. He was simultaneously trying to, um, you know, address population collapse, but in a way where we got to just expand our notion of Lahui and not expand, just kind of reinforce that real traditional notion of Lahui, which was a Pacific notion. Um, but there are others like Miley Arvin um, who talk about sort of uh, Miley Arvin, Kehaulani Kowanui, who take a much deeper dive into Hawaiian and white relationality. Um, I don't know if they talk so much about businessmen didn't want to breed with Hawaiians, breed whiteness into Hawaiians. They wanted Hawaiian women's land since the kingdom time. They didn't give a, you know, they didn't want white women necessarily breeding with Hawaiian men. They wanted to breed with Hawaiian women because Hawaiian women were a landed bunch of women. Um, and, you know, I think there's different angles that different scholars take around that. Um, and there are also really uncomfortable things to read. Um, that Hawaiians said in terms of Hawaii becoming a white nation, you know, I, Kuhio himself um, in some of the testimonies for the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act. Am I gonna take that at face value? Hell no, but it's something we gotta start grappling with too. So yeah, no, no sorry, not, not a super clear answer, but there's a lot of iterations of Hawaiian, and in a sense, this is positive eugenics. I'm like, how do I think about our Lee lines and the LPO in terms of like, <laughs> that was total, like, um, you know, it was about power, right? Our, our, our traditional Hawaiian genealogical practices, we call them genealogical practices. Not Thank you, thank you. Eugenics, yeah. I think that it might be time to wrap things up now. Um, since you mentioned my late Arvin, I am just going to take advantage of that and say that we will have my late Arvin here in as part nice. of the series. She will be speaking on August 12th. So I hope that everyone will tune in for that. It should be a really great talk as well. Thank you so much, Ilima, for um, you promised us a lot of tips of icebergs, and I think you over delivered on that promise. There's so many. Uh, so many things, so many rabbit holes to go down here and so many interesting ideas. Thank you so much for your time and, and for your talk tonight. It was wonderful. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm just going to drop my email in the chat. And if anybody wants a copy of anything I have, I will absolutely send it to you. Um, so only stick around if you want to hit me up. Oops. <laughs> there you go. K-E-R-R-Y-L at hoy.edu because I really do want people to pick up this research more. I'm, I'm moving on to other things. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks everybody for coming. Thank you all. Good night.